Brexit campaigner Aaron Banks is facing a criminal inquiry into alleged electoral law offences during the EU referendum. It's claimed that the millionaire Banks was not the real source of millions of euros of funding given to the Leave.EU campaign. Some MPs are now calling for Brexit to be halted while the UK's National Crime Agency investigates. Well, let's go now live to London and speak to Vincent McAvinney, who's there for us. Thanks, Vinny. Um, now, can you tell us what this investigation is all about and, uh, you know, the consequences and the impact it could have. Good morning, Isabel. Well, Aaron Banks is a fairly bombastic figure. He is a businessman who got heavily involved in politics during the Brexit referendum. And he was someone who was a bit of a money man for Nigel Farage, the former UKIP leader. But he also helped to set up and fund a group called Leave.EU. Now, they weren't the main Leave group during the referendum designated by the Electoral Commission, but they still did campaign heavily. And some of their tactics were pretty wild, particularly on social media. But this investigation by the Electoral Commission is into two amounts of money, £2 million and £6 million, uh, that were given to the Leave.EU group. They've been investigating them for a number of years, and they now say that uh, it's not clear that Mr Banks is the true source of the loans to the campaign and that the money had come from impermissible sources. So this is making the headlines today in some of the newspapers. It's on the front of the Financial Times and The Guardian, which has long been calling for greater investigation into sources of funding because there are suspicions that some of this money may have come from abroad. So the Electoral Commission, which is the regulatory body of elections, has now passed this to the National Crime Agency, saying that the uh, investigation has gone beyond electoral law, their remit. It is now a criminal case, and it is now an active investigation by the National Crime Agency into Aaron Banks. Vinny, can you tell us a little bit more about Aaron Banks? Because, you know, some of our viewers might not be that familiar with him because he is quite a controversial figure, as you're suggesting, isn't he? He is a bit of a controversial figure. He's someone who has, since the referendum, continued to be very active in his commentary and on social media using very uh, brash language. He describes himself as a bad boy of Brexit. And yesterday, when this story emerged, he simply took to Twitter, posting a picture of himself, uh, I think, in uh, Bermuda, uh, simply saying, gone fishing. And in a statement, he says that uh, he has done nothing wrong. He says he's confident a full and frank investigation will put an end to the ludicrous allegations levelled at me. So that's how he's treating this. He goes on to say that it wasn't money from abroad and actually singles out Russia. There's something that has been claimed that there was money coming in from Russia during the referendum. But he's someone who is uh, likely to fight this pretty heavily. He's someone who uh, takes, a, uh, takes a leaf from the uh, Donald Trump playbook. In fact, he and Nigel Farage actually went out to meet Donald Trump during the transition period between his election and inauguration. So I think we'll be hearing a lot more from Aaron Banks as he attempts to fight this. But this is now moving into more serious territory for him. When it comes to Brexit itself, though, it's unlikely uh, to do anything now. We are so far into this negotiation. This is a bit of a settled matter now, but it will add to the chorus of calls in the People's uh, Vote campaign, that's the campaign for a second referendum, that something wasn't quite right and that will add to the kind of bitterness about how that 2016 referendum went down. Vincent McAvinney in London, thanks so much for your insight there. In a highly symbolic move, the lights of the Eiffel Tower have been dimmed to remember journalists around the world who've been killed. Today has been declared the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. Since the beginning of the year, nearly 100 reporters have been killed. Most of them were not in conflict zones. The recent killing of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi is one of the most recent cases to be highlighted. Well, joining me live now from Paris to discuss this is Annelise Borges. Um, Annelise, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this vigil? Well, it was a sombre moment, uh, Isabel, while that minute of silence uh, was held, uh, while the Eiffel Tower's lights were switched off. A group of members of the French NGO Reporters Without Borders held uh, posters with uh, photographs of murdered journalists, including, of course, 
a photograph of Jamal Khashoggi, whose disappearance exactly a month ago has shocked uh, the entire industry and uh, the entire world. Of course, those gathering here in Paris last night once again demanding the whole truth on what happened to the former Washington Post columnist. One of his former colleagues was at that vigil last night and said that she hoped his death served a purpose. He, she hoped that his death served as a warning that much more needs to be done to protect journalists. Yeah, Annalise, you've reported from conflict zones, but we're now seeing journalists being killed on European soil. What are the increased risks faced by journalists today? Well, it's not a pretty picture at all. We've been talking a lot about Jamal Khashoggi because of the mystery surrounding his death and, of course, because of the brutal circumstances under which he might have been killed. But according to UNESCO, 86 journalists have been, called, have been killed so far this year. Between 2006 and 2017, over 1,000 were killed. That's an average of journalists killed every four days. And in 90% of the cases, the perpetrators go unpunished and so uh, the UN has been uh, has put together a panel of human rights experts and they have been calling on accountability so that the perpetrators are brought to justice because impunity according to this panel only triggers even more violence even more attacks and in a world where the relationship between certain governments and the press is worse than hostile where journalists are often accused of being, putting out uh, fake news every time the truth hurts power well uh, these uh, this panel has been calling on governments as well to stop inciting hatred uh, and violence against journalists and the media saying that uh, the good work of the media freedom of the press is paramount for the good functioning of democracies well, Annelise Borges in Paris, thanks so, so much. Women in the European Union still earn an average 16% less than men. Tomorrow, the EU Equal Pay Day will mark the moment when the European Commission says women stop getting paid compared to their male counterparts two months before the end of the year. Well, let's go live now to Brussels and speak to our correspondent, Maeve McMahon. Uh, Maeve, uh, that's quite a big gap, isn't it? Absolutely. Comparing that gap to two months of full paid work really brings those statistics alive. And in fact, if you look at statistics in the area of education, women in the European Union are doing as well or even better, performing even better in the field of education. But that is not being reflected in the labour market. And that is why the European Commission is taking the matter seriously and has christened this European Equal Pay Day. Franz Timmermans, that's the vice president of the European Commission, said women and men are equal. This is one of the EU's founding values. But women still effectively work for two months unpaid each year compared to their male colleagues. We cannot accept this situation any longer. Now, the Commission has spent some €3 million Euros trying to wear, raise awareness and put pressure on member states to do more. Decisions will have to be taken back over in the capitals, depending, of course, on what governments are in power. But the reasons, of course, are obvious. Women are taking time off work or going part time more in order to raise their families. Now, there is quite a disparity across the EU in terms of this gender pay gap. Um, can you give us a bit of an idea about that? Absolutely. Well, the gaps are lower in countries like Belgium, where I am, in countries like Luxembourg and Italy, and higher in countries like the UK, in Germany, uh, in Austria and in the Czech Republic. But it's not that black and white. In, in Austria, for example, and in Germany, most, um, a lot of women are working part time. Uh, so that doesn't really reflect the sense of equality among the European Union. But one country that's doing very well in this area is the non-EU member state, the Nordic Ice, uh, island of Iceland. Uh, they actually fine companies that employ more than 25 people if they do not comply with equality uh, regulations. And I spoke to a lady in Belgium about this earlier this week. She's a Flemish politician. And for the last 12 years, she's been chairing a group of progressive women. And she said she's going on virtual strike as of Monday. Let's take a listen to Inge Verhert. Here in Belgium, for instance, uh, we have uh, very, very similar legislation. Uh, it's just that uh, the people in Iceland, they beat us to it when it comes down to uh, implementation. And uh, I think that uh, what we'll need is uh, more progressives uh, in government in, uh, across Europe 
to make sure that uh, legislation is in place, uh, in place and that uh, implementation follows. So Ingeveer Hert, along with other socialist politicians from all over the European Union, are calling this unequal payday and not European equal payday. And they're using the hashtag close that gap and open your minds to raise awareness from Belgium and beyond about this issue. Well, Maeve, let's try and close that gap. Maeve McMahon reporting for us in Brussels there. Thanks so much.